What's up guys and welcome back to Mon Inc. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? If you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here to get some context for the Aeneid, well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video, and as you can see from the title, we're going to be going into Virgil's most famous poem. So before we actually get into this whole video, it's important for me to explain what the hell this video is and why it's here on the channel. So I have done context videos for both the Iliad and the Odyssey over here on Mon Inc. And they've gone down a storm. Like you guys seem to really like it when I give you guys a little bit of context before starting these big books and for starting these big and very important epic poems. So that's what we're doing today, that this is just context for the Aeneid before I start uh, breaking down each and every chapter as I've done with the other two books. So this video is for people who don't know anything about the Aeneid, for people who maybe have read the Iliad and the Odyssey with me, maybe you haven't done either of those things and you've just signed up for a class that has, you know, the Aeneid on the syllabus or something like that. And you need to know at least like one thing, like you just think that you should know, maybe one thing about the book before actually showing up to the classroom or, you know, reading it or whatever it happens to be. This is the video for you, okay? We're gonna try and keep it as simple as possible. It's a little bit difficult with the Aeneid because there is just so much going on. But uh, yeah, we're gonna try and keep it as simple as possible for you guys. So in saying that, why don't I just tell you actually how this video is gonna be structured so that you can skip if you so want to. Because I love making it easy for you guys. So we'll start off the video by going into the Aeneid itself, going into more so that mythological context, why the story is written the way that it is, uh, all of that sort of stuff. We'll then slide into Virgil and the author and discuss who he is and who, well who, like what more so, was his historical context for writing the book and then we'll combine both of them to do more so a general overview of Roman history and Roman context uh, at the time that Virgil was writing and why that impacted the writing and the Aeneid and the legend behind more so uh, the story itself. So we'll do it in those three ways. Hopefully that's gonna be easy enough to follow, but again, there's so much context for this book that I'm really cherry picking and choosing uh, certain facts to include in this video. So if you get lost, please don't be shy to leave a comment below. And also if you think that I missed something out that other people should know, then please also leave that in the comments below. I will be pinning the ones that I think are the most important and obviously replying as I always do to every single comment that I can reply to. So in saying that, why don't we just roll into the video? Virgil's Aeneid follows the story of Aeneas, who is our main hero, as you probably could have guessed if you've read the Iliad at least and you've seen the cover of this book and it says Aeneid, you could probably guess what's well, probably something about Aeneas. It follows Trojan hero Aeneas as he makes his journey from the burning walls of Troy, the burning city of Troy, all the way through uh, along the coast of North Africa and up into Italy in order to found the future site of Rome. Okay, so that's the basic storyline of the Aeneid. It's just this journey from Troy all the way through to Italy. It's a very long, it's a very long journey. Unsurprisingly, because it is an epic poem. For those of you guys who don't remember Aeneas, maybe you haven't read the Iliad or anything like that, that's totally fine. Aeneas is actually a very important Trojan in the Iliad. So in Homer's rendition of this little window into the Trojan War in the ninth year, we get uh, a couple of references to Aeneas and we do see him a couple of times on the battlefield because he's noted as being second only to Hector in fighting, right? So we know he's a very powerful man, he's a very good sword fighter, he's a very good warrior and a very well respected warrior, not only among the Trojans but also among the Greeks. That's important, okay, we're not taking on this character who's a nobody in the Iliad and a nobody in the Trojan War, we're taking on a very important Trojan character. His mother in ancient Greece is the goddess Aphrodite, we will be addressing that in a hot second when I continue to explain the context so nobody attack me just yet in the comments, but for those of you who are coming into the story, you'll probably remember that he is the son of Aphrodite, Greek goddess Aphrodite, and his father is a mortal man called Anchises. We also find out in the Aeneid that he had a son during this period and a wife. The wife doesn't survive, obviously, because she's a woman, it's a burning city, all of that sort of jazz, whatever. Either way, not running the story, promise. That is his family line and that is who he is. The Aeneid itself does not actually pick up from the burning walls of Troy, right? So that's not book one. Like the first line is not like Ananias was walking through the burning, no. So we actually pick up when he's in North Africa, right? And we hear the whole story of how he got from Troy to North Africa in hindsight. So at some point in book two, really, uh, and continue from there into book three, that we get this whole backstory of what happened uh, after the Greeks, you know, came up with the Trojan horse. We get that little uh, episode in book two, and we hear of how Aeneas ended up leaving 
and sort of where he ended up going first before he lands in North Africa with a queen called Dido. And then book four picks up in real time and we hear the story as he goes from North Africa through to Italy and through to the future site of Rome. So it's kind of like the Odyssey in that sense where the story starts off with real time and then it goes into flashback and then it goes back into real time, right? So that's how the story is structured and it ends with uh, Aeneas ruling over the Latins in Italy, right? So that's again, not ruining the story for you because it is thousands of years old. Because it's set during this time period, it means that it's set in the same time period that Homer was writing uh, about. So it's set in the Bronze Age of Greek history, but it's a mythological story, but it's the, the Mycenaean period of, of Greece. So that's about 1100 BC, 1200, 1100 BC is when the story is set. So it's around the same time. It is the same time as all of the other Trojan heroes. Again, Aeneas is one of these great heroes from this great time period. And that is important uh, for the whole story because Aeneas ends up being quite unlikable. And so you have to really harp on the fact that he's from this great generation of heroes and you have to be like a little bit sympathetic to him being from that period of time and then also trying to embody a new kind of hero or whatever. That's the story, okay? So it's only the beginning of this video and I've already referenced the Aeneid and the Odyssey like how many times? And it's very obvious, right, that this is directly impacted by those two books, not only from the time period that it's set in and the hero that it talks about, but also the fact that there's a line in book 20 of Homer's Iliad where Poseidon actually, when Aeneas is going into battle, Poseidon stops all the other gods and says, we need to stop, you know, looking out for the Greeks right now and look out for Aeneas because he has a great destiny ahead of him. He's not fated to die here at Troy. His great destiny is to continue the Trojan race after Troy falls, okay? And it was so obvious, right, that Virgil read that line and went, one sec, hold my pen, I got this. And so from there, he then writes Rome's very famous mythological founding story. Okay, before we continue, I know that I have said mythological founding story in regards to Rome like 100,000 times at this point. It's only been like, what, seven minutes of this video and I'm already just like, Rome's mythological founding story. And anybody who knows anything about Roman mythology will probably be watching this and be like, what about Romulus and Remus? Didn't they found Rome? You would be correct by that. That actually Aeneas does not found Rome the way that we know it today, right? So he doesn't build the walls. That was Romulus and Remus. He doesn't actually get to the land that Rome is actually built on. He doesn't get to the hills, none of that. He gets to Italy. And the importance of Aeneas founding the future site of Rome is that he comes to Italy and he brings this great history with him, this great lineage with him of the Trojan War and of Troy. And he establishes that in Italy, right? So he ends up ruling over the Latins with this great lineage and this great backstory. He rules over the Latins. His son then rules over Alba Longa. This is a prophecy that is told in the Aeneid, by the way, so we will get to that in the text itself. And then after that, generations and generations and centuries later, Romulus and Remus enter the picture, right? So it is not a story that is, it's either Aeneas found Rome and it's either Romulus and Remus that found Rome, that both of them, it's the acts of both of them that actually Aeneas sets off a chain of reactions that allows Romulus and Remus to then come into the picture and to then found the actual city of Rome much later on. Okay, so they literally build it and Aeneas just brings the history and the lineage to Italy that allows Rome to be great and to thrive and everything when Romulus and Remus actually end up doing their thing. So a very important thing to keep in mind about this book is that it is Rome's mythological founding story. Therefore it is Roman mythology, which thus means that this book is written in Latin, okay? And that means that a bunch of names are about to change. If you guys have watched my Iliad series and my Odyssey series, maybe you read it in your own time as well as watching the videos, which would be amazing. I love it when you guys do that. But you guys are used to now a certain set of names, you know, gods, heroes, all of that sort of stuff. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's all going to change. It all comes crumbling down, okay? You've got to learn a whole set of new names, which are just the Greek names. They're just the Roman versions of those names. So even heroes will change. So like Odysseus, you'll start seeing him as being Ulysses, right? So that, not even similar. Like why would the Romans do that? But either way, they do. So Odysseus then becomes Ulysses. We then have all the gods uh, that will change names, right? So. For example, the uh, Greek god Zeus, right? He becomes Jupiter. And then we have the Greek god Hermes who becomes Mercury, you know? So names are going to change. There are only two of the gods that are incredibly important that you cannot forget right throughout the series. And one of them is, as I said before, I said I would come back to this whole uh, uh, Greek goddess being the mother of Aeneas, right? So. Aphrodite becomes Venus. It is utterly important when you read this book that you know that Venus is Aeneas's mother, okay? It's not Aphrodite in this book. It's not Aphrodite in this lineage. It is Venus. That is vital. I will explain that in the Roman historical context in a hot second of why you cannot mix that up. And the other one is that Juno is a very important goddess 
in this story because she is the antagonist basically, right? So she's the goddess that torments, for lack of a better word, she torments Aeneas on his journey to found Italy and to found the future site of Rome. And that is uh, the Roman version of the Greek goddess Hera. So the queen of gods is now called Juno and she is just here to make Aeneas' life a living hell, basically. For those of you who didn't read the Iliad, you probably won't know that Hera was on the side of the Greeks and so therefore she hates all the Trojans, which is unsurprising that she is going to make Aeneas' life absolutely terrible because she wants the last of the Trojans to die. She knows that he has this great fate and she knows that she can't technically kill him, but she knows that she can push him up to the line and make him wish he were dead, which is exactly what she does. But don't worry about all these name changes, guys, because as the series goes on, when we encounter new gods or we encounter old heroes with new names, I will be putting a little note in the corner of the video just so that you guys don't sort of zone out and think, who the f*** is this? Like, don't worry. I'll be making it as easy as possible for you guys to follow the story as I can make it in these videos. But that's enough yammering about name changes and about Latin. You guys should probably know when the poem is written. That's kind of an important thing to tell you. So the poem is written throughout the 20s BC in Rome, again, it's written in Latin. Unlike Homer's epic poems, that the Aeneid only has 12 chapters, whereas Homer's had 24, right? So I'll explain why in a hot second why that is in the whole context of uh, the grander story of the legend of the Aeneid, but it only has 12 chapters. However, it is still written in dactylic hexameter. So it's still done in that same a thundering beat, more so warlike beat that Homer used to tell his stories. Uh, so it continues this, this same epic poem uh, uh, tradition, right, shall we say. So if you guys don't know what dactylic hexameter actually sounds like, unfortunately I have to sing it for you, I'm so sorry. But it's either long, short, short, long, short, short, long, short, short, or sometimes can be long, 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 short, short, long, 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 short, short, right? So it's done to that kind of a beat, which means that if you guys are like extra nerds who are watching this, if you want to do scansion on the Aeneid, you can scan it in the same way that you scan uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which does make it easier also because Latin is significantly easier than ancient Greek. So you can scan it in the same way, just in case you wanted to know. Now that we've said all that, though, you guys are probably sitting there going, all right, Erica, this is all great, but who the f is Virgil and what the f is he on about? Unlike Homer, we know way more about Virgil and way more about his life. Thank God, because it helps us in regards to context with this book and understanding the author. In fact, with Homer, we don't even know his full name. We just know that he's known as Homer, right? With Virgil, we know that his full name is Publius Virgilius Maro. Even though Virgil is known as a Roman author, he actually didn't start his life as a Roman at all, okay? So he was born just near Mantua in Italy, which is here on a map uh, in modern day Italy. But during the time that Virgil was born, this wasn't actually part of the Roman Empire. Where he was born was actually known as Cisalpine Gaul. So that was only absorbed into the Roman Empire in 42 BC. I say 42 BC, like officially 42 BC was when it was absorbed and considered part of Rome. And that's important to understand because Virgil was then not seen as Roman. For a good chunk of his life, from when he was born up until it was actually absorbed, when Cisalpine Gaul actually became part of the Roman Empire, he was considered technically as being foreign. But what sets Virgil aside from all the other people and what gave him a really good leg up is that he had an incredible education. Okay, so we know that he traveled for his education. He traveled quite far. He traveled to the best teachers. His parents gave him the best that they could possibly give him. And that's very important because in ancient Rome, that actually, it wasn't necessarily important if you were foreign or not, that what they really were focused on is what kind of Latin you spoke, which obviously did determine the foreigners from the non-foreigners. And so the people of Rome, the elite of Rome would speak in one way, everybody else would speak in another way, and they would look down on you. So Virgil spoke a very good kind of Latin, which meant that probably it was going to be a little bit easier for him to get into Rome and to get into that society. So that's important to take into consideration. Consideration. So we know Virgil moved to Rome, but we actually don't have any record of him getting married. We don't have any record of him having any kids. He might have, just nobody like wrote it down. But again, as far as historians are aware, he did not. We think more so that he ended up living as more so like a reclusive intellect, right? Which I kind of like vibe with. I'm sort of like, yeah, me and you both, mate. So his poetry, his writing, all of that stuff, took up the majority of his time. That's why we're gonna leave it with Virgil though, because again, that's a good chunk about the author that we know. Now, what's really important is that we have to move on to the Roman historical context for this book. The Roman historical context is what makes the Aeneid, in my opinion, so effing incredible. Like, I'm not even joking that the legend that surrounds the book, the, the whole time period that Virgil was existing in is just so cool that he lived through all of this and he could channel it into his book as well is what makes the Aeneid so special as a standalone book and that, you know, lets it stand aside from Homer and really be important and really cool in its own right. So I'm very sorry there are gonna be quite a few dates in this little section because it's the only way that I could figure out to do this. So the first date 
is 44 BC. And that's the date when Caesar, Julius Caesar, was assassinated in the Senate by Brutus and a bunch of conspirators. So this moment is so important to Roman history. If you guys didn't know the date, uh, remember that one, internalize that one, because this is the moment where Rome changed from being a republic to being an empire. So we changed from having you know, multiple people in a seat of power to now having one person above everybody else in a seat of power. And so when Julius Caesar died, he adopted his great nephew, who's this guy called Octavian. He will later be Augustus, but that doesn't happen right now. He does change his name. We'll get to that when he does it. So he adopts his great nephew, Octavian. Octavian then takes over. And this is around 44 BC-ish that this whole transition is happening. And Octavian takes over uh, all of these incredible roles that Julius Caesar has. He inherits all of his power, all of his money. And Julius Caesar didn't have a lot of money, but that's a whole of thing. And this is important because there was lots of war that was happening on either side of 44 BC, right? So before there was lots of battles, after there's lots of battles. There's lots of civil war happening in Rome, there's lots of battles happening around the Roman Empire, and one thing that would happen during this period was that if you were a soldier, that legally, when you came back from war, then people, like random civilians, homes and possessions and whatever, mainly homes and land, could be repossessed and given to soldiers. Why am I mentioning that? Because that supposedly happened to Virgil's family. So Virgil's family is one of the people who had, during this period, who had their home repossessed and given to soldiers. That was like soldier payment, right? That it was like, you could go risk your life, fight for me and all of this and come back to like a really nice stately home. So Virgil's family had their home repossessed and taken away. What does this mean for Virgil? It means that he's now going in the gutter in regards to his money. He's got zero inheritance. He's got a really job. He's only just recently even been considered as Roman. So now he can start climbing the ladder. He's f***ed basically, and he knows he's f***ed. And so he's got to actually, you know, pull up his bootstraps and get to work. So what does he do is he seeks patronage from this guy called Mycenaeus, and he actually ends up getting it. I don't actually know if you say Mycenaeus, by the way, this is how you spell his name, but he's a very important guy. And this work relationship ends up being the most important thing to happen to Virgil, because as soon as he gets into contact with Mycenaeus, Mycenaeus is one of the two chief aides to Octavian. So he now is connected to the most powerful man in Rome. And Virgil went from being flat broke <laughs> and basically like, what the f am I gonna do? To then being connected to the most powerful person in the entire empire. Phenomenal networking, Virgil. 10 out of 10. This patronage gives Virgil the leg up to actually being able to publish his works. Okay, so the first work that he publishes is called the Echologues. Most people haven't read that. It's not that impressive, that's why. So he publishes the Echologues in 37 BC. And then following that in 29 BC, he publishes the Georgics. Now, most people who have read Latin will have read the Georgics. It's just a lot of farming poetry uh, because he was a little farm boy when he grew up. So it's natural that that's what he was gonna do. Because either way, that gets published in 29 BC. Now, now in 27 BC is when Octavian takes on the name Augustus, so he legally changes his name. It's sort of his way of being like, ha, f yourselves, Rome. I'm so powerful, I can change my name to holy one, to mean revered one, because I'm that great. So that happens in 27 BC, and from about 29 through the 20s, Virgil starts working on the Aeneid, right? And he ends up being quite good friends with Augustus. Like, we know that they actually hung out a lot, that he was connected, obviously, through the patronage to Augustus. But actually, when it gets to 19 BC, this is the most important year for Virgil. And that's because he gets invited on this trip to go to Greece with Augustus, right? So he's going with the emperor to Greece from Rome. But unfortunately, he doesn't make it to Greece. Instead, on the way there, Virgil gets really sick, actually. And after a couple of days, he decides that he has to turn around and go back to Rome because he's too ill to go on and to keep going to Greece. So he gets out, he turns back, and he never makes it back to Rome. In fact, he stops here in modern day Italy. And actually, Virgil dies in 19 BC, right? So he's writing the Aeneid and he dies before getting back to Rome. And he dies, most importantly, before finishing the Aeneid, okay? So the Aeneid is an unfinished book. Remember how I said that it was 12 chapters instead of 24? So when you read the book even, as you're reading it and it gets to the last page, there is a moment where everybody goes, is that it? That surely can't be it. But alas, it is. That is all we have of the Aeneid. Now the most interesting thing to me, the most important thing about this whole context for you guys in regards to explaining the Roman historical context and explaining who Virgil was is because when Virgil dies in 19 BC, okay, Either this was written down in his will, or he said it verbally on his deathbed that he wished for the Aeneid to be burned. That blows my mind. Like genuinely, when I found that out for the first time, I was like, no, why? Oh my goodness. Unfortunately, we don't know why he actually wanted the Aeneid to be burned. There are lots of theories, you know, one of them is as simple as like, it wasn't finished. He didn't want anybody to read it. And so he was like, just burn it. If I can't finish it, make sure it goes down the drain. The other one could just be that he didn't like 
the characters in it. Maybe he wanted to go in a different direction with the story. You know, we don't know. It could be something as simple as that. But what's important to take into consideration with this detail is that the Aeneid paints the Emperor Augustus incredibly well. Like, I mean, this is a great portrayal of a powerful, powerful entity and a powerful lead to an empire, right? And that was the one of the points of writing the book is that he had this great uh, political propaganda that was woven into the Aeneid. It wasn't a flattering portrayal, like that's a super important thing to note, but flattering and a strong portrayal of a good leader are two different things. So maybe he wanted to burn it because he didn't like that portrayal of Augustus. But obviously Augustus knows that this book is being written. He knows how he's portrayed in it and he's loves it, right? And so he completely, unsurprisingly, completely ignores Virgil's dying wish and he demands that it is published. There are some accounts that say that possibly two of Virgil's friends went in and they edited some some little parts of it, you know, sentence structure, syntax, whatever. They edited a little bit of it to make sure that it was up to par to being published. But Augustus was like, publish that thing. I look amazing in it. And so that's how the Aeneid got published. So one last point though, one last point about why Augustus probably wanted this to be published is that one thing that Julius Caesar did as well as Augustus and when he was Octavian he also did this too is that they had their lineage being linked back to Venus so they said that they were connected to the gods that they were descendants of Venus the goddess of love through Aeneas so they had been saying this for years before it was written down okay that was how they ended up ascending to such power well that was how Caesar ended up you know justifying his ascent to such power and it's also one of the factors one of because this is a very complex thing that I can't really get into in this video but one of the factors that helped Caesar get deified when he died right so he was made a god when he died and uh then Augustus does that and then a lot of the people in this line end up being deified upon their death so that's how they did it they had this connection to Venus so obviously Augustus is gonna see this book where it's written down that it's like they have direct lineage written on paper right written down for everyone else to read and everyone else to study that it was in there that they had some connection to a goddess of course he wants it published like i'm not surprised that this thing ends up being published under augustus's uh, guide and under augustus command but that's about it in regards to the context because i could literally be sitting here all day describing each and every layer of the aeneid and i think that's why so many people have a love affair with the Aeneid, that it's not just, you know, the story that you can enjoy, because obviously without any of this and without knowing any more detail than I've put into this video, you can 100% enjoy the story of the Aeneid and really love it. But we learn so much about Rome during one of the most important moments of Roman history. And I think that's why so many people love this book so much and appreciate it just so much. And it's, again, it's one of the reasons why I love it. And I have a tattoo literally of the first line of the Aeneid on my body, because I'm just like, this is incredible but again that is where i'm gonna leave you guys so thank you guys so much for watching this video i honestly cannot wait to start diving into the aeneid these videos will be a little bit longer throughout the series because the aeneid is a little bit thicker um because even though it is 12 chapters it is the same length as the other two uh, epics. So each episode will be a little bit longer. They'll probably go over the 30 minute mark, but I will try my best to summarize as best as I can to my best ability. But yeah, thank you guys so much. We'll be seeing you next time with Aeneid book one. 